So now I'm going to show you how to use the firmware to evaluate the PGA450. So TI provides a sample firmware for you to use, and it uses Kyle Microvision 5. And there's actually a free trial version that you can go download of Kyle Microvision 5, um, and it will let you work on programs up to 2 kilobytes in size, um, which this program is under. So you can make modifications to it, you can do whatever you want with it using the free trial version. And then once you start developing your firmware more and have to exceed that code size, then that's when you would have to buy the full version. So when you open up the Kyle Microvision project, um, the first thing you'll see are these several files. So the main file, of course, is where the program starts and basically just runs through an initialization routine and then it sits in a while loop. So the structure of this program is such that it's using um, interrupts it's an interrupt generated program. It'll use interrupts, so whenever it receives a lin message, it will go to the appro appropriate interrupt. So the initialization file, or the PJ450 init file, um, it runs through the initialization routine. So what this is doing, um, we can run through it really quickly. It's initializing the GPIOs, um, it's setting up your basic configurations, so it's setting your VREG voltage, um, whether you're using an internal or external clock, in this case the internal clock. Um, you're setting your bandpass filter, so right here. So you would need to change this if you change your um, transducer frequency. It's setting your downsampling rate, um, initializing LIN, um, initializing your timers, um, communication, and finally enabling the interrupts that will let the rest of the program run. And then once this completes, um, the PJ450 is just waiting for those interrupts to continue executing code. The PJ450 ISRS C file, um, this is where the interrupt service routines are stored. So this sample firmware uses um, LIN communication to talk to the PJ450. And the PJ450 is acting as a LIN slave node in this case. So um, the GUI is sending out the LIN message. It starts with a, sync, a break field, then a sync field, and then a PID field, and PID stands for product identification. And um, then finally are the data fields. So the way this program is written is that the PJ450, as soon as it um, recognizes the PID, this PID interrupt service routine is, um, is flagged. And depending on what the PID is, is how the PJ450 will react. So if we send a message of 11, this is what triggers a distance measurement to be taken. And then depending on what the data, data is, as you'll see later on, is whether it will take a short or a long distance measurement. Um, if it sees a 21, this is the test, the test, uh, test method. So in this case, the PJ450 will transmit 1, 2, 3, 4, shown here, um, back to the GUI. And we'll be able to read this to make sure the LIN communication is working correctly. The case of 22 is if you want the PJ450 to tell you the time of flight of its latest distance measurement. So this is how you actually get the results back. And then 31 is if you want to write to the EEPROM um, through the LIN. So the data would be the seven bytes of EEPROM in this case, and the PJ450 would write those bytes to the EEPROM. So once this occurs, um, and if the if the master node, which is the GUI in this case, continues sending to the data field, um, sends data, then the LIN um, psi RX data ISR will be triggered. Um, so in this, and this is where the meat of the program is. So down here, first we have a switch for a PID. So once again, the PID is basically telling what kind of operation we want. So 11 is when we're actually doing a distance measurement. So the first thing that it does in this case is it checks um, what the data field is. If the data field is 1, then we're doing a long distance measurement. And it will send the appropriate number of pulses. So this is um, 18 pulses in this case. So the blanking timer, which we've set to the maximum since it's for a long distance measurement. Um, and it'll send what data bits or what bits you want to um, store in the FIFO, in the FIFO control register. Um, Finally, it'll load the threshold values um, that you've stored in the EEPROM. Um, so you'll, you'll store these threshold values into the EEPROM, um, 
the upper nibble, nibble will contain the threshold for long distance measurements and a lower nibble will contain the threshold for low, uh, short distance measurements. Um, so if the R received data is not one, so if it's zero or anything else, then this will run and this will load the settings for short distances. So we're using a one pulse, um, we're lowering the, the blanking timer, we're storing the um, mid 8 bits instead of the lower 8 bits into the FIFO, and we're loading different thresholds. So at this point, the, continue, the program continues to run, and this is where we're actually setting it up to about to do the measurement. So we're enabling, this is basically enabling VREG, and it's activating um, the digital data path, making sure that everything's ready for the measurement, to, the distance measurement to happen. Um, enable control, this will clear the FIFO memory, um, and then this is where we set the frequency by the burst on and off time of the low side drivers that are driving, that is driving the transducer. So in this case, we set the on time to be 8.6 microseconds, um, which is equivalent to um, sending out a 58 kilohertz signal. Um, the dead time is basically, um, it's saying how long you wanna wait between when the um, one low side driver switches on to when the other low side driver switches on. So this is a little, there's a little bit of time where neither is switched on. And this is just to give it some time, um, and it might help with some performance issues to play with this, but this, this is a great setting to start with. So finally, we wait here for VREG to be ready. And so um, basically VREG is uh, it's center tapped to the transformer, so you need it to be fully turned on and ready to go before you actually start the burst, or you won't get the proper signal out. And then finally, this enable control register, so it actually starts the burst. Um, so the way that this, um, this firmware operates is it immediately records the time after you start that burst. And then later on, it's going to be evaluating point by point as the data comes in and is stored in the FIFO RAM, it's going to be saying, okay, is this point, does this point cross the threshold? Um, and if, if, and if it ever does, as soon as it does, it will then take another timer measurement. And then the difference between those two times is the time of flight. And that is what will be reported back to the GUI. So after this, um, here we are disabling the VREG. This is just to help with noise, so you get a cleaner measurement. And we're enabling the echo. So this is basically telling it, okay, now we can start filling the FIFO RAM with data. Um, and then, of course, you want to disable interrupts so that it doesn't suddenly react to something else and stop, stop uh, processing. Here is where we do, we're actually crunching through all the data points that are stored in the FIFO RAM. So this is the echo signal that comes back and it's being stored point by point. Um, if we're doing a downsampling rate of 40, um, and with the one microsecond downsampling time, basically every 40 microseconds, it's going to be executing this. Right here is where the code will pause while it waits for the FIFO write pointer to, um, to increment. So as soon as it does, then it will read that newly written uh, byte and process it. Um, so of course, we want to do things slightly different for long distances and short distances. And this section right here is where it's looking at the last four data points. And it's basically averaging them um, in both cases. And it's seeing if it's past the threshold. So in this case, um, we're saying that for everything over you know, 255 memory location, um, you're just going to average four, four bytes and then see if it's above um, 40. And we're adding them together so the actual average is 10. So 40 divided by 4. Um, and then down here in the else statement, this is where we have the varying threshold. And these are the values that were stored in the EEPROM. Once again, you're doing an average of four points and you're seeing if that average is above um, where your threshold setting is set. And it works very similarly for your short distances. Um, just the numbers are slightly different. So you see in this case, um, it's 16, so that means the average is four instead of 10 is in the long distance. 
So finally, we check to see if we have in fact crossed the threshold. If it does, that's when we log the free running timer and that gives us the time of flight. Um, after that, um, it turns or it prepares for the next measurement by turning on the VREG once again and turning into active mode and um, it clears the enables. So that's all what happens if you start a distance measurement. See, it was quite a bit. This other case is just if you wanted to, um, once again, the case of 31 for the PID, and this is if you are trying to uh, load the, these data points into the EEPROM. So it's a much smaller portion of code. And that sums up the, how the firmware works. Um, of course, if you have more questions, you can always ask them on the E2E forums, and we'll be happy, happy to walk you through it. And hopefully, this provides a great starting point um, for you to start developing your own code. So once you've written your firmware and you've built the project, now you can load the firmware into the PGO 450, and I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So if you open up the GUI again, um, the first thing if you're loading the firmware is you'll want to make sure that the microcontroller is in the off state, once again, so you can write to all the registers. So in this case, you will go to the DevRAM tab, um, load hex file into GUI, and I'll, I'm going to back out of the project so you can see where this is located. Um, so this is the project folder, Got it, called it firmware rev 2.1.1. You'll want to go to the DevRAM version, um, output, and then pg450.hex is the file that will be generated. Um, so, the PGA450 has 8 kilobytes of OTP and then 8 kilobytes of development RAM. And the reason for this is um, during your final project, you probably don't want to re rewrite the memory of the PGA450.